good to have Miss Linda Huggins with us today. Amen. Associate Calvary, pastor from over at Calvary. Linda was ordained an elder in the Church of Nazarene in the District Assembly in 2011. A wonderful lady. This is not the first time she has come over here to speak to us. We look forward to what she has to say. Would you come and share with us this morning, Miss Linda? Thank you. God bless you. Sometimes we try to keep secrets with walls. We have all kinds of walls. 
Sometimes life is so big that we can't seem to make it over the hurdles in front of us. Those are walls. They're problems, they're difficulties, they're things that we encounter that make life hard. And today I'm going to talk to you about those walls. And I want to take you to some very, very, very familiar walls in Scripture. The walls around the city of Jericho. How many of you, when you were children, learned the song, Joshua and the Battle of Jericho? My son confessed to me a couple years ago that he always thought that it was Joshua and the Battle of Cherry Coke. <laughs> I kind of like that. He didn't know what Jericho was, but uh, he knew what Cherry Coke was. So he thought it was Joshua and the Battle of Cherry Coke. But unfortunately, it's not Joshua and the Battle of Cher Cherry Coke. It's Jericho. So let's, we're going to take another look. If you want to turn in your Bibles, we're going to be in Joshua chapter 5. But while you all are turning there, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about what's going on where we pick up our story today. See, the Israelites were God's chosen people, and, and God had delivered them out of slavery. He had delivered them from Egypt, and he had delivered them out of slavery, and they were walking through the wilderness when they decided that maybe God was not powerful enough to get them into Canaan. And so uh, God made them walk around in the desert for 40 years. They are at the end of a 40-year journey to learn who God is and how powerful he is in their lives. And there they are. Their leader has been Moses all this time. Moses is the man who uh, confronted Pharaoh, who delivered them out of this bondage, who has led them all these years, and Moses is gone. And now they have Joshua. Joshua is a man of incredible courage and godliness. Joshua walked with Moses. He learned at the feet of Moses. He was with Moses on the mountain when Moses got the Ten Commandments. He saw the glory of the Lord himself. And Joshua has now been chosen to lead these people into the promised land. So here they are. When they came out of Egypt, remember, they had crossed the Red Sea, right? God parted the waters of the Red Sea, and they crossed. All those people that cross now are gone. This is their children. And they're going to go into the promised land. So what God does is he parts the water of the Jordan. And the Jordan River parts and they walk through. Those children of the people that had walked through the Red Sea walk through the Jordan on dry land. And there they are. The manna has just stopped. It's time to enter the country. And we're in our very first bed. God pulls that right up in front of the city of Jericho. Now, let me just say this about God. I don't understand why God had to pick Jericho. Jericho was probably the strongest and the most fortified city in Canaan. They were starting not, not, God does not give them the easy stuff, the little cherry picking places to start, where they can just kind of go in, conquer real fast, move on, get some confidence built up. No, 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 no. God crosses that right in front of Jericho. Jericho was known in the land of Canaan for its walls. Men could march around the walls of Jericho. That was their, their fortress. It was totally their protection. They had these walls. They were so proud of their walls. Nothing had ever gotten through the walls of Jericho. It was considered to be the strongest fortress in all of Canaan. God wants to stretch you. God put them there on purpose, right in front of that city. And he wants to stretch your faith. Jericho was going to be a confidence builder to them. God was going to say to them, we're going to do this. We're going to do this my way. And I'm going to show you what you can do. Have you ever really believed in yourself? God wants us to believe in ourselves. He wants us to see that us plus God equals victory over so many situations in our so many times we are faced with these almost impossible walls that are in front of us, and we think, there is just no way. I guarantee you that's exactly how they felt. Why in the world do we start at the top? It's because God wants you to see victory from the eyes of God. You know what? In the eyes of God, those walls of Jericho were not any bigger than the little tiny city that was totally unprotected stressing out over our problems. God has got this thing under control. God is not 
sitting there going, well, I think maybe we'll try Jericho and maybe, maybe God knew all along that those walls were a fall. He was good. He didn't lose a minute of sleep over it. God had it all under control. We need to see the power of God. God does not need to practice his power to make it work. We need to see the power of God. God is going to show them nothing, nothing that you will face is going to be too big for me. Are you looking at a wall today? God wants to build your confidence. And that's where he is right now with Joshua. So we start out in Joshua chapter 5, verse, verse 13, with Joshua taking a little bit of a walk. So if you want to turn there with me. It came about Joshua went on walking by Jericho, and he lifted up his eyes and he looked. And behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and he said, Are you for us, or are you for our adversaries? And he said, No, rather I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and he bowed down and he said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is hollow. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel, and no one went in and no one came out. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and all the valiant warriors. You shall march around the city, all the men of war, circling the city once. You shall do this for six days. And also the seven priests carrying seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. And then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the walls of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up every man straight ahead. Really? Really? That was the plan. That was the plan. Well, see, first of all, I want you to look, before we talk about the plan, look at Joshua, because Joshua was a man of courage. He went out to look at the walls. He did not go out to stand there and say, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have any idea, Lord, look at these walls. are just too big. We can't do it. Okay, guys, we're going to turn around. Let's come up with an exit strategy. Maybe this isn't really the place, so what we're going to do is just sort of make it go around Jericho. Maybe we can sneak into the net. He didn't do any of that. He was out looking at the walls. He was taking a walk around the city. He was going to go see what the, what the problem really was. But Joshua looked up. You see, all of a sudden in front of him was this man holding a sword. And uh, it says here, in verse 13, that he lifted up his eyes and he looked. And that's when he saw the man holding the sword. Well, who was this man? Well, the man was what's called a theophany. It was a picture of Jesus. Uh, he looked up and he saw Jesus. But it took a lot of courage to look up. Joshua was out there trying to figure out what he was going to do. Have you ever been in a place where you were trying to figure out what to do? How many of you have ever been woken up in the middle of the night with a problem that you couldn't think of a solution to? Have you ever been there? Have you ever sat there and tried to figure out, okay, I don't have any idea what to do? I have no idea. I have a problem. It seems bigger than I am, and I have no idea what to do next. How many of you are there right now? Life is full of difficulties, it's full of challenges, it's full of problems. God never says, never, not once in scripture does God say, come to me, I'm going to take away all your problems. Do you know that? He never says, being a Christian means that your life is now easy. Full of just absolute dream peace and easiness. It's not true. We live in a fallen world, and as long as we are here, until God takes us to glory, life has problems. It has challenges, it has difficulties, and it has problems. I only have a little tiny mind. Okay, it's this big, it just fits right in here. I don't have the mind like God does. I can't see the answer to all of my problems. I live in time. I live here where I can't see tomorrow. I don't have the foggiest idea what's going to happen tomorrow. None. Not a clue. I think I might have an idea, but it, you know, easily could turn out to be 
not true. How many of you have ever been, how many of you have ever been surprised by your day? Okay, we don't wake up thinking that things are going to happen. Sometimes they just do. God has that all under control. He has it all under control. There's a plan. But see, we want to sit and look at the walls, don't we? We figure it out. How are you paper and pencil people? I'm, I'm kind of a paper and pencil girl. So when I have a big problem, I, I will get out a legal pad, and I will sit down, and I will line down the middle, and I will prose over here and cons over here. Did you ever do that? Or I will run numbers and try to add it up and figure out how the money is going to going to stretch, or I will, I like it on paper. I like to see it written on paper. Um, frequently, I will get it all written on paper, and I will start praying, and God will say, you know what, throw the paper away. Throw the paper away. We're not going to do this by logic. You're just looking at the walls. You're not looking at the, at the conqueror of the walls. You're just looking at the Sometimes we just charge full speed ahead. You know what? Forget that that wall is there. I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to tough through it. So we just charge full speed ahead right into the wall. What happens? Crash, bounce back. What do we do? Charge full speed ahead into the wall again. Crash, bounce back. Sometimes we just try to overcome it with brute force and sheer strength. Right? Doesn't work, does it? Sometimes we try to form an elaborate plan. What if Joshua had been out there and he had said, okay, this is a big wall. So what we're going to do is we're going to build this siege ramp. So we're going to start back here. That would have been traditional warfare for that day. We're going to build a siege ramp. And we're going to start here and we're going to build this ramp. And this is how much brick it's going to take. This is how much stone we're going to have to go collect. This is how much dirt we're going to have to fill in with. And this is what we're going to do. And we're going to lay siege to Jericho. And this is how we're going to do it. What if he had done that? He could have. That would have been traditional battle plan for the day. He didn't do that. He was waiting to hear from God. Sometimes we form a committee about our walls, don't we? Well, group, you know, group force, uh, the, the committee, the collective brain, and we see what other people think, and we go get ideas. Do you know somebody that talks incessantly about their problems? Always. I uh, have a friend who is just just wants everyone to be aware all the time of all the many difficulties in her life. You know somebody like that? So it's constant. Nah, 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 this, this, this. Nah, 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 this, this, this. Never wants the solution. If you should try to say, have you tried this or I will pray for you. Oh, well, I've done that. Nah, 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 this is why that won't work. Nah, 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 nah. We want to form a committee. We want to get as many people involved in our problem as we possibly can. We want to gather up all the people and all the ideas and all the opinions. And then we want to talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. Never actually do anything about it. Form a community. Sometimes we just want to sit and cry. Sometimes we just give up. Sometimes we just look at the wall and say, the wall is bigger than you. And we stop trying. We sit there with the wall. But Joshua didn't do any of that. And so what he did is he looked up. And when he looked up, he saw a man standing there with a sword. Now, that would have scared me. i got to say, that would have scared me a little bit. Joshua, man of courage, not even scared. He looks at the guy and he says, are you for us or are you for them? Which team are you on? Tell me, do, are, you, are you with me or are you against me? Tell me now. See, sometimes the people that are around us and the people that we see are not people that are for us. If you want advice, Go to somebody who's going to give you the advice from God. Go to someone who's going to pray for you. Are you for us or are you for the enemy? That's what he said. And the man says, oh, oh son, if only you knew. See, I'm the angel of the Lord. What he was is he was a theophany. He was a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. Joshua's looking at Jesus. He's looking at Jesus. And he realized. But you see, we're not going to see Jesus until we look up. If all we focus on and all we want to see is the wall in front of us and the problem that we have, we are only going to ever see the wall. God is not going to force our chins to go up and our eyes to look at him. We have to choose to lift up our head and look at God. Now he's standing right there. He's right there. What I want you to do is do these 16 steps to clean up your life.
life and you fix it as much as you possibly can and then when you are absolutely desperate, I will come in and I will clean up the mess that you have made and, and I will fix your problem. Well, God says, I understand, Linda, that you have a problem. So pick up your little head and look up at me and I'll fix it. we got to look up. we got to be willing to look at God to see the solution to our problem. And when Joshua looked up, he saw Jesus. The answer's coming when you look up. But immediately after Joshua looked up, he bowed down. See, as soon as Joshua knew who he was talking to, he fell on his face to the earth. He bowed down. He said this. What message does my Lord have for his servant? What he did not say is this. Good. I am so glad you're here because see, here's the problem, God. This is the way that it is, okay? I got this wall and I got these three million people over here and we got to get through here and we're supposed to capture Canaan. And this is the problem that I got because I don't know how to get around the wall. So these are the six things that I thought about doing. Do you ever do that to God? I do that to God all the time. Okay, God, here we go. Here's the issue. Here's what I think should be a good solution. Would you like? He said, well, what would you have me do? We need to come to God with that on our lips. Okay, God, what would you have me do? What do you need me to do today, Lord? What is it that's your answer? I'm ready to hear you. So many times we come with our preconceived solutions. God, do this. Or we bargain with God. God, let me see. Here's the problem. And uh, if you do this, if you, if you save me, if you get me out of this one, then I will never whatever it is, right? How many of you ever made a bargain with God? If you fix this mess, I promise you, I will never do it again. Does it work? No. <laughs> it does not work. We come with that. Or how many times have you ever just prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing happens? And you think, God is not listening to me. God is not listening. You know what God's hearing is just fine. It is not God that is not listening. Perhaps in that case, we're too busy talking to fellow directions. What God wanted was not to hear Joshua's battle plan or to hear all the things that he was willing to do or what he had laid out. What God wanted Joshua to do was to listen. Here I am, your servant, Lord, and tell me what to do. God needs people if he's going to change this crazy world of ours who are willing to stand before him on their faces, on their faces before God and say, here I am, Lord, and do with me whatever you want. Here I am, Lord, I'm going to follow your battle plan, whether it makes sense to me or not, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but did that make sense? Absolutely not. Okay, he needs people who are willing to stay wherever you take me. <coughs> and Joshua's all ready for the battle plan, and the man looks at him and says, take off your shoes. off your shoes because where you're standing is holy ground. Please never, never, never forget that when we are listening to God, we're on holy ground. We have a God who is our Father. We have a God who says, you can run to me, you can climb in my lap and you can say, Daddy, and you can tell me everything that you need. I intensely love you. That's the God that we have. Don't forget that your daddy is holy. Don't forget that this is holy ground. Don't argue. Don't argue. So many times we see people who are so willing to come to God and they're so willing to listen, but then they always want to put their own conditions on. They want their spin. They want it to be their way. So many times that person has been me. God is holy. What he was saying to Joshua is, we're going to have a holy moment here, me and you. This is going to be a moment between God. I'm serious. Take off your shoes. It's holy ground. It's holy. When else do we hear God saying that to somebody? Remember Moses in the burning bush? If we go back to Exodus chapter 3, we see Moses is in the wilderness. He's a shepherd. And the wilderness working for his father-in-law. He's 80 years old. And uh, he thinks his life is pretty much over and he's done all he's ever going to do. And he sees a bush that's burning but doesn't get burned 
And what God wants is for us to be willing to be holy people, to be vessels that he can use, to take off our shoes, to lay aside every encumbrance, to understand that we stand on holy ground, and to be willing to say, yes, Lord, to God. So are you willing to be that person today? God has amazing things in store for the people that are willing to say, I'm going to go where you go. I'm going to do what you do. And I'm going to be as close to like Jesus as you will possibly let me be in this world. That's what he was asking. Take off your shoes. This is holy ground. It's holy. So God's told him the plan. Boy, did God have a plan. Joshua, I'm sure, I'm sure, was expecting a battle plan. <coughs> he was expecting something like he'd always known. This is how you conquer a city. See, Joshua was trained at the foot of Moses in the art of war. He was trained that this is how you do it. Military training. This is how you conquer a city. And most of the time when they conquered Canaan, that's exactly what they did. You know, this is the only time that God told them to march around and around. Okay, it's not like this was the battle plan for the rest of Canaan. This was one time before the beginning, and there was a reason for that. But God says to him, this is what I want you to do. March around it seven, one time a day for seven days, silently. Then we're going to have the big seven times around on the last day, and the walls are going to magically fall down. Well, let's go to uh, chapter 6, verse 6, and I want to read with you what happened. Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and let seven priests carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Go forward and march around the city, and let the armed men go on before the Ark of the Lord. And it was so, that when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns went before the Lord, and they went forward and blew the trumpets, and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priests and blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the Ark while they continued. The trumpets. But Joshua commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout, or let your voice be heard, or let a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I tell you, shout. And then you will shout. So he had the ark of the Lord taken around the city, circling at once, and then they came back to camp and spent the night. Now I want to stop right there and I want you to imagine these people. There is this army of men that are ready to come in and capture the city. There are all of these people following Joshua. You notice Joshua does not sit and tell them the whole thing. He tells them, come on, get up. We're going to go out. We're going to march around the city once. And we're going to blow trumpets. Don't say anything. We're going to go all the way around the city once. And we're going to go back to camp. Now, that's weird. It's weird. It doesn't even, I mean, I read mean, it doesn't make any sense. I know the story doesn't make any sense. It's weird. He says, go march around the city one time and then come back to camp and then... We're going to do it. So they do it. Day one. Nothing is any different. They get up and they do it day two. Nothing is any different. They get up and they do it day three. Nothing is any different. By day four, day five, day six, they do it. They go out, they march once around, and they come back. And you know what they're asking? Why are we doing it? Why am I sitting here spinning my wheels? We came to conquer the city. We did not come to march around and do nothing. What is the plan? It is not working. Why am I here? Have you ever felt that way? God, why am I here? You see, all the problem is we're just in day five, y'all. We don't see day seven yet. Day seven has not yet hit. We're in day five. I know it may be day 405, but we're in day We are sitting and spinning our wheels. I do not understand why God has not taken the situation yet and fixed it. They are sitting there on day six, and I guarantee you what they were saying to each other is, really, how many more days are we going to go and get up and march around the city? Nothing is different. Joshua's crazy. That's what they were saying. Guarantee you. That's what they were saying. Because you see, they were in the middle. Are you in the middle? Have you ever said, why am I still here? Why is this happening? Why? 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 I've got a reason for you. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. It's the same reason that God has for the Israelites, and it's the same reason that God has for you today. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. 
not by might and not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. It is the same answer that God had for them, and it is the same answer that God had for you. We are in this thing until God takes the walls down. And that's going to be by God's strength, by God's spirit, and with God's power, and in God's time. Can you see tomorrow? I mean, I want you to know that I think that I know what's best, okay? I always think that I know what's best. I am a very strong-willed, first-born Yankee. I always think that I know what's best. I don't. I don't. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God wants to do something that we cannot comprehend. And the way that he's going to do it sometimes means that we march around and around and around. For six days before day set. Six days might be a long time. But we're not here to do it our way, we're here to do it God's. You see, what would have happened if they had walked in to the most powerful city in Jerusalem, or in Canaan, if they had walked into the most powerful city in Canaan, and totally by their own resources, by their own battle strategies that they had been taught and that they knew, if they had just conquered the city quickly, what would have happened? They would have believed that they could do it themselves. God does not want us to believe that we can do it ourselves. God is always going to put us in situations that stretch us so that we can see that it is by faith that we walk and it is by faith that we conquer. They needed to know that lesson. He never did this again. I think because one time of this was enough. I think that after watching this happen once, they never again believed that they could do it without. They conquered Canaan, and they did it God's way. But this is how God started their journey. I don't know where we are with your walls, and I don't know what God is trying to show you. But what I want you to know today is that it's all right. God has a plan. You're just not today setting it. But it's going to come. And when it does, walls are going to fall. And they're going to fall in a way that only God can do. You're going to see the hand of God. As only God can show you. That's the lesson of Jericho. So let's look at what happened at day seven. Joshua rose up early in the morning. And the priest took up the ark of the Lord. I'm sorry. Go to verse 15. On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawning of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only on that day, they marched around the city seven times. At the seventh time, when the priest blew the trumpet, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you this city. This, the Lord has given you this city. So the people start to shout. And the walls fall down. Go to verse 20. The people shouted, and the priests blew trumpets. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people walked into the city, every man straight ahead, and they took it. It didn't fall down in pieces. It didn't fall down in sections. It wasn't taken down a little bit at a time. It wasn't done by battering rams. It was done by people shouting praise to the Lord. And it completely fell. And every single person walked straight in. Every single person walks straight in. No remnants of the wall. Victories happen and walls fall. And someday it will be day seven. Whatever is happening in your life, understand that victories happen. Please, victories happen. God can do things that are absolutely amazing. Some of the most amazing victories that we have are God giving us the endurance. Every single day, wake up and praise Him again. That's a victory. That's a victory. Some of the victories that we have are that our faith grows so deep. And our walk with God grows so real. And our life grows so pure. That other people come to know Jesus through how He's taking us through the difficulties in our lives. That is victory. Victory doesn't always look like it does in our economy. God did not promise us an easy life. Please don't pray for an easy life. Please don't pray for things. Please pray that the victory of God in your life will be that other people can see Him. That God's name will be glorified. That people will know and fear the Lord because of the, what they see in their 
long as people see Jesus, that's victory. As long as people can see in my life and in yours that there is a hope and a future, then we have victory. Those walls can fall. But the last thing that I want to share with you today is that they blew the horn. And those horns were not just any horns, they were ram's horns. And ram's horns in the Old Testament signaled the coming of Jehovah. What they were saying to those people behind the wall is, God's here. God's here. We've had six days where we've been marching around and now God's here. God's here. Does your life proclaim like a ram's horn that God is here? Blow the trumpets. Blow the trumpets, y'all. Shout and sing and blow the trumpets and let this world know that God's here. It's not incredibly popular right now to be a Christian, is it? I, I didn't think that ever in my life it would be quite this unpopular to be a Christian. Um, I'm constantly having to defend the fact that I'm a believer, and that kind of is a little weird for me. Um, but but it's not particularly popular to blow the horn of the Lord these days. It's not particularly popular. People have very preconceived notions about Christianity, don't they? We're supposed to be blowing a horn. We're supposed to be the ones that are saying God loves you, God cares, and you come find grace at the foot of the cross. You come find mercy at the foot of the cross. You come by redemption at the foot of the cross. And the more we say that to a world that needs love more than I've ever seen a world need love, the more people whose lives can be changed, the more walls that can fall down, and the more things that we can conquer because of that love of Christ. Blow the horn. Be proud to be a believer. Be proud that Jesus saved you. And be willing to share that with whoever you see. See, there's a lost and hurting world. Um, I want to tell you a little story about a man that I know. He's, he's broken. Um, his life has not worked out the way he thought it should. But he's been so wounded by Christians. And sometimes we do. Sometimes we do. Accidentally. He's just been really wounded by the church. He doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, has made it very clear to me that I can be his friend, but I can't talk to him about God. I kind of like that it's a challenge for me. It's a personal challenge to live out Jesus without speech. I think that's good. So uh, I have loved him and tried to pour as much grace into his life as I can and tried to show him as much Jesus as I can, but he is slowly making steps toward the cross. And someday, Someday I'm going to stand with this, with this person that I really have grown to absolutely love. And we're going to stand at an altar. And I know that those walls around his heart are going to fall. I know that they are. But I know that it's going to be because I'm letting God win the battle in God's way. There are situations in your life where what God is telling you to do is march around and around. Not scream and yell. Not be militant. Keep marching around and around and around. Keep sounding the trumpet of the Lord. Keep saying grace. Keep working in people's lives. How many of you have people that you desperately You do. You do. I want to bring hope to you today. That those walls around their hearts can fall. That those things that keep them from God can fall. The more we love, the more we act like Christ in their lives, even without saying the word. God has a battle plan for everyone. I don't know what you're going to face this week. I don't know what trials are going to come your way. I don't know what I'm going to face this week. I don't know what things are already in your life that seem insurmountable. I just know that we have it. What I would like you to do with me today is to look up and see Jesus. I would like you to with me this week not look at the walls, but look at the Lord who's over the walls. Look at the God who has a plan for conquering and tearing down every wall, and then bow down. As we bow down at the foot of the cross, and as we bow down before the Lord and we say, I am your servant, you do with me and through me whatever you will, God is going to change the world. We may stand up to the same walls, but we will not be the same people. That's the victory of God in our would you please pray with me? Would you all please stand up, Ashley? Now, would you all please pray with me? Father, right now in this room, there are walls that I can't see. There are problems in people's lives. There are things that seem insurmountable. There are issues that they can't count. Some of them are in our own lives. Some of them are in the lives of the people.
today, in this place, in this room, we're going to stop and we lift our eyes up to see you. You have a battle plan that will be different in every single one of our lives. You already know the beginning from the end. You already have victory. Thank you, Father, for the peace that passes all understanding that you're going to pour it in our hearts right now as we lift our eyes up to you. And Father, we just want to say this morning that we're your servants. That we come to stand here and say, Lord, do what you want to do through me. Father, we yield the hearts. And Lord, I know that whatever it's going to take, and whatever we walk, and whatever we see, you're going to do a work through these people. For us to be healed in our eyes. And Lord, right now we want to say thank you to you for the victories that are going to come, for the lives that are going to be changed, and for the things that are going to happen because we trust you. So Lord, whatever day it is in our lives, if we're just beginning to march around the problem, or if the walls have been there for a long time and we're waiting for you. We just ask, Lord, that you would continue to make us as faithful and as courageous as Joshua was. That we would do the plan. That we would do the work of the Lord. And Lord, that you would, you would show us the walls fall. That we would rejoice in the victory. But Father, help us to pull our horns. Help us to be the people who announce to the world that Jehovah is on his way. That God is here. And God is here to do a work amongst, in the world. Thank you for all that you're going to do, Lord. And help us to live that life yielded to your will. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for being willing to let God change the world through you. Would you please um, shake hands with your neighbor and uh, tell them thank you for being here.